I use the title Muslim Zion uh, because it allows me to bring together Pakistan and Israel um, as, in a sense, twin entities. Um, uh, not only were these two countries founded within a year of each other, but Israel was founded upon the precedent, the legal precedent set by Pakistan in 1947. Uh, and what I wanted to do by uh, making this comparison possible is to show how the the political logics of countries like Pakistan and Israel don't emerge from their own regional context, that they are part of a global uh, set of uh, political logics. So in, in this case, um, um, attaching both Zionism and Muslim nationalism uh, to ways of thinking about nationality that are not rooted in deep history or in blood and soil, as in uh, so much of European nationalism. One of the things that, of course, um, is crucial in bringing together Zionism and Muslim nationalism in particular is the, um, uh, the emergence of the minority as a distinct political category. This, of course, only happens with uh, statistical forms of measurement, uh, with census taking, with demography, um, uh, all ways of knowing about peoples which constitutes them into majorities and minorities, uh, something that starts happening in the 19th century. Uh, so in this process, Jews most famously are made into a minority uh, within European countries, but also globally. And in being made into such a minority, they become representatives, if you will, or the archetypical minority. And it is in this way that the Jewish example is appropriated by many uh, outside Europe Muslim nationalists not least, who are constantly comparing themselves to European Jews. Um, and in both cases, you have the problem of uh, uh, how do you deal with this category minority within policies that are becoming majority defined, which are becoming majoritarian nation states, if not um, um, uh, nationalized empires. Um, this category, therefore, uh, grappling with this category of minority is crucial for both Zionism and Muslim nationalism, uh, as is the corresponding category majority. Um, how can one be a minority? How can one resist becoming a minority? Should one actually try to become a majority? These are the kinds of questions that inform both movements. The historiography focuses on the emergence of Muslim nationalism out of its regional context. So it's either a history about British India or at most about the British Empire. Whereas what I think is more important is the fact that Muslim, like Indian nationalism, had by the end of the First World War already broken through the crust of British terms and categories. And both these movements had become globalized, uh, just as Zionism was globalized. Uh, so they are taking their influences uh, and their modes of thought from all over the world. In particular, uh, Muslim nationalism is informed by the emergence of these new ideological forms, communism, most importantly, but also fascism to some degree. Um, and these forms are important not only because in the interwar period they seem to as to herald the future of politics itself around the world, but also because they are formed explicitly on the basis of ideas uh, that with communism particularly, what you have is the attempt to reject the past, to reject all that is given to a people and to form a polity within an explicitly global context. And that is what Muslim nationalism really finds attractive. Um, it too would like to constitute a Pakistani nation, if you will, within a global context, global Islam being the global context here, uh, but also one that is premised upon the rejection of the Indian past. They are utopian to some degree, of course, though, though at the same time, in all cases, you have the attempt to make them into realities, often in a very, very brutal way. Uh, and so they become realities. They don't remain utopian in that use of that uh, of the word utopia. Um, they are as real as anything can be. Uh, the thing that makes them distinct is the 
the explicit reliance upon the idea and nothing else. Uh, of course, those who create polities on the basis of what is inherited by a people are also mythical in some sense, right? I mean, the, the, uh, what one is meant to inherit as an Englishman or something is largely a kind of invention of tradition. It's a myth in its own right. Uh, but it provides a, a more multiple or multifarious set of bases for belonging, one that appears to be uh, normal, uh, uh, which people can more easily recognize. Whereas these states and polities that are based on ideas or doctrines uh, uh, have to be fought over, I think, uh, in a much more aggressive and self-conscious way, partly because they have never really been normalized in the same fashion. Well, I take the phrase sepulcher of uh, Muslim nationalism, of course, from uh, Hegel's characterization of um, the Crusades. Uh, where he says that, you know, the Christians who wanted to recover the Holy Sepulchre, um, the tomb of Jesus, uh, were engaged in a paradoxical task because all they got when they conquered Jerusalem was an empty tomb. Uh, and the whole point of Christianity was that Jesus had risen uh, and he was not to be found in a tomb. Um, uh, what strikes me as being apposite in that um, uh, that com in that uh, example, uh, for Muslim nationalism is this fact too, that uh, the, the nation or the polity or the state that was in the end achieved um, could not but in some ways um, give the lie to its own ideology, uh, which is all about uh, a polity formed on the basis of an idea alone with nothing belonging to it. In some sense, uh, the emergence of Pakistan uh, ended up destroying uh, the ideology of Muslim nationalism and by forcing it to compromise in various kinds of ways uh, with what I'm calling a more normative or normalized form of nationalism. So it inherited uh, with Pakistan a whole set of politics uh, which could, it could no longer afford to ignore, whether these were ethnic or regional or something else. And so what we see in Pakistan's history is a battle uh, to uh, preserve uh, the idea of Pakistan um, as in its purity, as something that rejected everything that was given to a people by nature or history. Um, uh, on the one hand, uh, and an attempt on the other to somehow accommodate with what had been given to a people by nature and history after all. I don't think what I'm doing is counterintuitive when placed in larger historiographical contexts. Uh, but when placed within the study of Pakistan, yes, it's counterintuitive uh, because uh, historians of Pakistan have tended to focus only upon certain kinds of uh, things. They don't really deal with the idea of Pakistan at all, or they deal with it simply as an epiphenomenon, as a kind of um, bargaining counter, or, or as a form of um, uh, a thought which had no integrity or seriousness to it. And I really don't think that that is an appropriate way in which to write history.